Are they leaving? Are they staying? Bible reading? Ever praying? Will the church be ever graying? Don't you see why we are saying, are the kids all right? Welcome to Are the Kids All Right, the latest subseries from The Holy Post. Whether you're a parent, a youth pastor, a teacher, or a young person yourself, you've probably seen all of the headlines concerning Gen Z. Rates of depression and loneliness are surging, their relationship with technology is kind of troubling, and they are leaving the church in droves. We've talked about these trends a lot on The Holy Post, but we're not alone. 10 by 10 is a new collaborative discipleship initiative whose mission is to make faith matter more for this younger generation. You'll hear more about the great work they're doing later in the show, but we've partnered with 10 by 10 to create this series and to hear from experts in each episode about the challenges young people and those who care about them are facing. One of those experts is Ryan Burge, a political scientist, pastor, and Holy Post pundit. He's known for his deep understanding of data about religion, and 60 Minutes has even called him one of the leading data analysts on religion and politics within the United States. Over the last few years, he's written several great pieces about the religious trends among Gen Z. Phil Vischer sat down with Ryan to find out if the kids are going to be all right. I am here with Dr. Pastor Ryan P. Burge. I guessed P, but I was right, and I'm very, I must have seen it somewhere, and it kind of encoded in my brain that it's Ryan P. Burge, because I just pulled that out of the air, and I was right. Well, that's how, like, on on books and stuff, I'm referred to as Ryan P. Burge, so that must have deeply imprinted on you. Okay, yeah, yes. I've seen it enough times that your marketing is effective. Is there another Ryan Burge that you're trying to distance yourself from by throwing the P? So there's a which, footballer. Which monkeys also do at the zoo. Yes, yes. there's a footballer. <laughs> there's a foot. He does not throw his pee at me. Uh, <laughs> but every once in a while, I'll get on Twitter, someone mentions me about how awful I am at soccer. Oh. And I'm like, I am awful, but yes. you're talking about the wrong Ryan Burge. You are correct. Wow, that's it. That's interesting. I do not share a name with any footballers or rugby yours or any, really anyone. I don't know of another Philip. There's a Philip. Uh, Visser that that someone uh, introduced me to in Canada, in Calgary, V-I-S-S-E-R. That's Did close. you take a picture with this Phil Visser? That's, no, no, um, I guess I should have, but I was just, yep. I didn't, I, 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 he was too close. You're too close to my name. Get away. Get back. <laughs> You're my Give doppelganger. Me. This is weird. Yeah, and I don't like it. I don't like it. This is not what we're supposed to be talking about. Uh, Ryan P. Burge is a data scientist at Southern Illinois University. Eastern Illinois University. Eastern Illinois University. I was so close. Good job. Um, and is one of, uh, he's a Holy Post pundit, and he's an expert on, yeah, he's holding up his Holy Post pundit uh Cup, mug, um, cooler, tumbler, t- whatever tumbler. it's called. I don't know. Sorry, sorry, tumbler. Whatever you call it. And we like to bring him in when it's time to look at the data. And so we're looking at the data on the kids, how the kids are doing. Are the kids all right? And he's written a couple of pieces in the last year on Gen Z and new data on Gen Z that we want to take a look at. Okay, so here's some stuff from Ryan P. Burge on Gen Z. First of all, how can you be a pastor and a data scientist at the same time? Because pastor is all about people. Data scientist is all about numbers. How can you go back and forth? I, I don't know. It's all I've ever done, Phil. I was a, I started a youth pastor when I was 20 years old, and I started in grad school when I was 23. And I just kind of, what, what I always say is like, the one thing I have to remind myself is that these spreadsheets of surveys, like every yeah. row is a person, like it's an individual and they have their own like yeah. thoughts and feelings and loves and fears and stuff. And so, yeah, but you don't want to take them out for coffee. You just want to no. glean them for data. No, I don't want to. I, listen, I love people, but I don't want to have conversations with lots of people. I'd rather, I'd rather look at a survey of 10,000 people than interview a hundred people. That's yeah. Well, I, I don't have the temperament for that. Yeah. Okay. I hear you. Okay. Uh, Gen Z, we're talking about uh, people that were born in 1996 or later. When does Gen Z end, and what's after Gen Z? Uh, you know what? I've heard Gen Alpha. People are already talking about Gen Alpha. Okay, I don't know. and then I don't know because it's like it's their 20 year. Are they 20 year cohorts? What's a generation it, these days? Uh, they vary. You know, like the baby boomers was big. It was like uh, over 20 years, but then like Gen X was pretty short. 
Huh. I, listen, all generations are made up. Like from a social uh-huh. science perspective, generations uh-huh. don't exist. When we, we do it, we actually try to break people into five-year birth cohorts. So let's say you're born with like 1940 and 1944. Or 1945 and 1949. So okay. instead of doing like 17 years, you do like five year breakups. But the public yeah. loves them some generations. So this, yeah, I, I got to okay. give you what you want. You know. So it's not really your choice to be dividing people up like this. I got to no. say, I had been going to all the reunions for my five year birth cohort, and it just got overwhelming. So I stopped. <laughs> I stopped going after a while. I couldn't take it anymore. Uh, Gen Z, born in 1996 or later, up to some point where we're not quite sure it becomes gen alpha maybe maybe but we don't know okay yeah here's what we know about gen z the data tells us gen z is much less religious than prior generations as of 2022 nearly half of gen z report no religious affiliation okay Mm -hmm. that's correct right Mm -hmm. okay here's a quote from ryan p burge Dr. Pastor Ryan P. Burge, it seems statistically justifiable to say that by the time the United States has another presidential election, half of Generation Z will identify as atheist, agnostic, or nothing in particular. Okay, we are coming into a presidential election year, so that we're, that's here, that's now. Oh, the trend line is, I mean, it was 40, of Gen Z, it was 39% in 2016. 45% in 2020 and 48% in 2022. So, okay. I mean, you add 3% more to that and you're at 51% wow. by 2024. More uh, more data. Millennials and Gen Z are the only generations where more report no affiliation than report Protestant affiliation. So it's first time, first time, I assume first time in American history. As far as we know, yeah. Yeah, we have a generation where there are more unaffiliated people with zero religious affiliation than with Protestant Christian affiliation. Mm-hmm. Yep. That seems like kind of a big deal. Oh, it's, it's a huge deal. And actually, what's really interesting about when they pick nuns, when young people pick like what type of nun, they get, they get yeah. like 12 options, right? Running from like Protestant to Muslim to Mormon to Hindu. And the last three options are atheist, agnostic, nothing in particular. Yeah. What's really interesting about young people is, you know what the most popular choice they make out of all those choices? What? Nothing in particular. About what? one third of college age people today, so yeah. 18 to 22 year olds, pick nothing in particular. More people pick that than pick Protestant, which is about 21%, and Catholic, which is about 15%. So we almost have as many nothing in particulars amongst college age kids as we do Protestants and Catholics combined now. And that's not even including atheist agnostics, which is like 7% and 6% on top of that. So we're seeing a dramatic, and I tell people all the time, like I don't try to oversell this, but I really do think this is like the biggest cultural shift in the last hundred years. And it's Mm -hmm. happened so like under the radar that we don't even understand what it means for society, for politics, for government, for anything else. Yeah, well, that leads me to my next question, Ryan. What does it Mm -hmm. mean for society, for politics, for... (laughs) For government, what and and do you do? Does the data give us any uh, reason? Like why? Why is Gen Z walking away? You know, not just necessarily from like evangelicalism, but mm-hmm. from religious affiliation. So I have to plug the book that just came out this week called The Great Dechurching. I did all the data for it with Michael Graham and Jim Davis. Uh, oh, hey. I, you got a book out this week? I do have a book out this week. You didn't know week. that. You know, it, it's not just amongst young people, but I'll say this. Yeah. Here's like the top line finding that I've been telling everyone. You know the number one pe- reason that people are dechurched now? No, I, I do not. Because they moved. What? Yeah, because they moved. They just moved to a new location. They they did they, they didn't have their childhood church anymore or whatever church they've been grown accustomed uh-huh. to. And they just go, you know what? I'll find a new church eventually. And, and they, and there's this there's this, like this perception that we have, right? Like that, and this is like the Twitter wars ruin us, our brain because we're like, oh, ex evangelicals and cultural problems and patriarchy yeah. and all this stuff. If you really look into reasons why people leave religion behind, it's almost always a slow slide. Not yeah. like a, a stochastic event where it's like I was and now I'm not. It was like I went once a week and then I went three times a month and then I went twice and then I started going once every two months. Over time, they sort of slide away from religion and just never kind of pick it back up. They don't have this like sort of like antipathy towards the politics or the culture or the patriarchy or purity culture or any of that stuff. It's just they 
they left and don't feel like they missed anything, so therefore they're not coming back. Wow. Okay, You're, what was the number two reason? If number one reason was I moved and my church didn't move. What? It, was, it was I didn't fit in with a local congregation. Oh, okay. that's number two? Which is really hard, by the way, because it's like, yeah, but what does that mean? Like, yeah. it's very amorphous, you right, know what I mean? It could be like, right. I don't fit in politically or right. racially or age-wise or, you know, whatever it is. So that one's like harder to nail down. Like, That's what exactly not very is. helpful. No, well, my job is to write not helpful books. For yeah, okay. Okay, before. so number one is I moved. So yeah. we need to either prevent people from moving or we <laughs> need to encourage churches to follow people around the country. That's exactly, that's exactly, you know what, like there's, so um, our, the guys I wrote the book with are pastors in Orlando, Florida, which is a rapidly growing area because everyone yeah. wants to go see Disney or whatever the heck they do down there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and they actually have a really good strategy, which is talk to the realtors. Yeah. You know, like because realtors know people who are moving into a community and those realtors can point you towards a congregation that might be, you know, helpful in your transition to a new place. You okay. got to find these like touchstone points where people are right. moving that you can kind of grab them and, and, and get them back in church before they fall away and just don't come back. OK, but uh, Jen, what else do we know about Gen Z mm -hmm. that that would enlighten us about these trends we're seeing other than it's not just that they're moving more than other generations? Yeah, like, I think the one thing I would say is they're deeply um, skeptical of institutions. OK, and, okay. and that's that's not just religion. Yeah. It's, it's much bigger than that. Right. Yeah. It's banks it's corporations it's unions it's media it's politics it's government it's really every facet of society we've lost trust in over the last 30 or 40 actually post watergate is when institutional trust really fell off a cliff because before that the media sort of propped up these figures and like you know they didn't talk about jfk's philandering and they never showed fdr in a wheelchair like mm -hmm. they really tried to like create a perfect image of our presidents and then right. then we realized wait a minute these guys are all you know like not these good people messed up Exactly. And then, you know, if you think about what's happened with American religion, trust in religion has declined unbelievably. over the, And it's, it's declined, by the way, primarily amongst younger people. Okay. Okay. Because they've grown up in a media environment. Like, think about, like, I grew up in the 1980s and 1990s, like, the with the, the PTL stuff and the Falwell stuff and the right. Robertson stuff. And all these scandals are what leads. And so scandal, like, breeds distrust. You know, there's mm -hmm. a famous saying in newsrooms, we never report on the planes that land safely. You know, we never report on the pastors who just do their job, right, and, and, yeah. and do good things in the community. It's always the guys who mess up is the one that makes the news. And so we have a lack of trust in institutions, and I think we're actually, a lot of younger people are rejecting labels. What's interesting about young people is they're not much more likely to identify as atheist agnostic compared to older people they're more likely to identify as nothing in particular, mm -hmm. which means they're not walking all the way away from religion and towards atheism, agnosticism. They're kind of rejecting everything, yeah. right? Like, I, I don't want to be an atheist, but I don't want to be a, a, an evangelical either. I just kind of want to, about religion, I just shrug my shoulders and go, meh, I don't know. I want to be me. I want to find the true me on TikTok. <laughs> Is that what they're saying? Am I getting closer? <laughs> Well, in my generation, it was Fight Club. You are not a beautiful and delicate snowflake. Like, that was the mantra of our, uh -huh. of our generation. Everyone wants to be a snowflake. You want to be unique, but you're just like everybody else. Okay. All right. Another interesting thing, another piece you wrote was about the gender gap, uh, about how historically, and I've heard this a lot, women are more likely to go to church than men. Women are likely to be m more likely to be religiously engaged than men. Uh, people have lamented through decades and probably centuries that, oh, there aren't enough men in church, or church is too feminine, or Christianity is too feminine, and we need to man up. We need to, and I think that was one of Billy Sunday's big things back as, you know, in the 20s and 30s was a, a muscular, masculine Christianity is what we need to strengthen America. Okay, something has changed. The gap between women being religiously engaged and men being religiously engaged narrows for millennials, and then for Gen Z, it flips. That's a big deal. That is a big deal. Women born in 2000 or later are less likely to be religious than their male cohorts, most prominent among white men and women. 
less mm -hmm. abund, uh, among minority men and women. Education makes a difference. The more education a woman has, the more likely she is to still be religiously engaged. The less education, less likely. Um, but this is this is really wild and and really surprised me. What else? Mm -hmm. What else can you tell us about that? What else should we know about that trend? And, yeah, is, and is the Barbie movie going to change it? <laughs> Probably not. The Barb I don't know. Bar Oppenheimer is going to bring people back to church because they're oh, going to think yes. about their immortal doom and all those kind of yes. things. So yeah, maybe it right. works both ways. Um, so for, for all of millennia, like social science has just assumed that women are, are more religious than men. And it's actually a really interesting puzzle, like why that is. If you like look mm -hmm. through the literature, like no one can really figure out like why that's the case. Maybe because women tend to be a little bit more social than men do on average. Uh, women tend to be, you know, more children focused, and they want to have children raised up in a religious environment. You know, mm -hmm. who knows what what the reason is? But it's just been assumed for a long time, and the data's backed this up that women are more are slightly more likely to be religious than men. But amongst younger folks, it's flipped, and. The only answer I can think of is, you know, we talked about, like, John Eldridge wrote Wild at Heart in 2004, mm -hmm. and then, uh, you know, Mark Driscoll came in with his, like, masculine Christianity, like G UFC Jesus, you know, during, you know, the late 2000s, and I think his whole, his whole, I get what he was trying to do, right? Mark's trying to say, like, the gap, we need to bring men up to women, like, where yeah. they are in the trend line. We need to make them more religious, because they were sort of fading away. But I think by him doing that, like it kind of recast evangelicalism a little bit, a little more masculine trait, and that actually stopped the the, the religious decline amongst men. But it, it the women accelerated because of that. I think they were sort of repelled by that whole idea of like masculine mm -hmm. Jesus, and we're like, wait a minute. And you also can't discount politics and all this, right? I mean, yeah. young women, especially when it comes to the issue of abortion, if you look at polling data, young women have moved more on abortion the last couple of years than any other demographic group, because largely because of Dobbs, I think. And the fact that abortion used to be sort of like a static thing in American society, and now it's significantly shifted policy-wise. And a lot of women blame church for that, blame religion mm -hmm. for that, and have walked away because of that. Okay, uh, it's some of the some of the stats were kind of interesting. the The fall off in adherence to Catholicism is slower than the fall off of adherence to Protestantism. Yeah, I, I, you know, and if you if you because I'm thinking about scandals, you know, and obviously the Catholic Church had a huge abuse scandal. I'm wondering if, if because it was you know 20, 15 years ago, have we kind of digested the scandals of the Catholic Church? And now we're being smacked in the face of the with you know scandals in the evangelical church and the mis misogyny and and the Trumpism in the evangelical church, and is it is it making the Catholic Church look more appealing <laughs> because there's because it's less crazy you know mm. is is, there, is our primary concern now the churches that appear to have lost their minds. And that the Catholic Church top down, and maybe it's partly the appeal of Francis, you know, Pope Francis, like, oh, he seems like a decent guy. I'd have I'd have tea with that guy, as opposed to, you know, the hotheads that we see on Twitter or on, on Fox News from the SBC or from other corners of evangelicalism. Um, do we know anything in the data about why Catholicism seems to be holding better? So it actually might be a completely different explanation than all that, okay. which is that Catholicism in America, for whatever reason, is a much more cultural idea than Protestantism, right? Yeah. So for a lot of Protestants, like you're, it's not familial for most people. You know, it was like my I'm third generation, you know, Missouri Synod Lutheran or whatever. Yeah. Like no one does that. Um, if you stop going to Protestant church, you're much more likely to slip into becoming a nun than you are if you're Catholic, because Catholicism is a cultural thing. Let's say you come from an Irish family, or an Italian family, or an Hispanic family, right, where you are third, fourth, fifth generation. Catholicism has always sort of had, like, it grows deeper into our, our familial tree, right? And it's, you, you don't leave that behind. You might never go to church. You might not have been to Mass in 15 years. But when I ask you on a survey, what are you religiously, you'll say you're Catholic because your family's Irish or Italian or okay. Hispanic. So I think that's probably part of it more than anything else. Is they're, just, they're probably nuns functionally. Okay. You know what I mean? Like They don't really have a religious tradition, but they're still Catholic from just a, a cultural marker idea. Yeah, okay, okay. Well, that's interesting, although I do, I do also wonder that, 
you know, given the intellectual traditions within Catholicism and the Jesuits and, you know, places like Notre Dame and th that as, as parts of evangelicalism have become more staunchly, you know, anti-science or, you know, anti-vax and anti-evolution and anti, you know, all this stuff. If for some people, because I know some people that weren't Catholic, that were evangelical and are now Catholic. You know, mm -hmm. and, and I do wonder if there is a, a little more of a um, uh, intellectual rigor and, and respectability of, you know, of, of Catholic tradition and Catholic education that you don't find the equivalent of in, in historic American evangelicalism. Yeah, I mean, there's, you know, what the scandal of the evangelical mind is that there's no yeah. evangelical mind. Right. Right. Like evangelicalism has not, unfortunately, been known for its academic rigor. No. Um, but some of the most you know, some of the most prominent universities in America academically are, are Catholic universities, right. you know, run by Jesuits primarily. And I do think Catholic social teaching is is way richer. Yeah. Right. Talking right. about the poor and talking about health care and talking about all these issues. Protestants don't really have not really spent, you know, a long time thinking about those issues from like a biblical perspective, at least in America. Like it's not part yeah. of mainstream culture. It seems like the Ameri actually when I was writing my dissertation, I thought about writing it on why evangelical Protestants are so capitalistic, like so low tax mm -hmm. and low regulation, because there's really nothing in Protestant theology that talks specifically about like those ideas. It's almost like the social issues led the charge and mm -hmm. the capitalism thing sort of like was drug along for the ride. But what's funny about that is I couldn't find any good data or any good theories about that. So I was like, ah, it's a good idea, but I really can't write a whole dissertation about it. On the Catholic side, you can write 10 dissertations about how Catholics feel about taxation and capitalism and yeah. all kinds of economic issues. So it's just you, a different thing. So is is there data, this, going back to the gender uh, gap among uh, Gen Z and, and church attendance and religiosity, is there data that shows Gen Z women are more anti-capitalist than Gen Z men? Ooh. I know yeah. they tend to be more liberal, right? Yeah. So they I identify left of center, and I think you can trace a straight line with Dobbs and I think Trump mm -hmm. with all that stuff. And and we see not just Gen Z, by the way, millennial women too have moved leftward on a bunch of a bunch of issues and how they identify they've moved leftward. Really, like I think who it is is like the college educated, oftentimes uh, you know suburban style young professional woman is the one that's really been move significantly over the last five or ten years i don't think for them economics like as in high level economics matter but when you see things like if you look at polling questions on paid maternity leave mm -hmm. they're very much in favor of paid maternity leave even conservative young mm -hmm. women are mm -hmm. even in favor of paid maternity leave because they're understanding like it's hard to minimum wage raise right. that to 15 dollars an hour that's very popular so i do think there's you do see some you know, sort of like, I won't say socialism, but definitely like some populism stuff, mm -hmm. um, even mm -hmm. amongst younger uh, conservative Christians, because they realize that if you want, like, if you want a post ops world, right, you got to support mothers, you got to support babies. And how do you do that? Basic economic things like minimum wage, maternity leave, stuff like that. Okay. Okay. So, Pastor Ryan P. Burge. Yeah. Burge. Burge. Sorry. Burge. Um, what are you doing? to try to keep Gen Z engaged at your church, uh, to keep young kids. And what do you, would, when other pastors seek you out as a data scientist, what advice do you give them? Do you have to stop uh, catering to men or stop talking about uh, conservative politics? Or do you have to care? What do you have to do, <laughs> Ryan? Well... First off, there's nobody from Gen Z in my church. <laughs> okay, let's like oh, this. I have I have eight people in my church on a typical Sunday, and they're all like eighty or older. So hey, Ryan, that does not seem like it's going to pay your bills. Uh, it does not. That's also why I'm a college professor and author yeah. and and a holy post pundit because they give me yeah. tumblers like oh, this. Oh yeah, so free can, tumblers. Free tumblers. That's you're, what it's all you're about. You're in our you're in our tumbler of the week club, and then you That's can resell them on on uh, eBay. I'm going to sign it and sell it. No, I think what I tell, what I tell, listen, I, I tell my, when I teach, I, I teach religion and politics sometimes, so we have to talk about religion. Yeah. And I think the problem for a lot of young people is they've never heard Christianity described in any meaningful, educated, intelligent way. You know what I mean? Like, they've yeah. never really thought about what it means to be a Christian. All they hear is the hypocrisy and the prosperity gospel and the Trump and all that kind of stuff. 
I think they're actually really, there's a hunger there for them to think about spirituality in a refined, educated, more sophisticated way where you'll say things like, well, this is why Christians do this. Like, this is the motivating, this is how they understand Mm -hmm. the concept of, like, humanity or the environment or whatever it is. One thing that I always talk about when I talk to, like, church groups especially is I think we have to start thinking about Christian doctrines that transcend politics, right? Mm -hmm. And one of those Mm -hmm. is Imago Dei. I think that, to me, is like, we need to—I never heard that growing up, the concept of Imago Dei, which is every human being is born in the image and likeness of God and therefore deserves respect, like deserves life. Mm-hmm. And so that speaks to all sides of the political spectrum, right? It says that God cares about the unborn, which Republicans love, but he also cares about the illegal immigrant, which mm-hmm. Republicans don't love, right? It's saying that God cares about everyone, and we should think about that. So what I tell pastors in, if you don't talk about politics, they're going to be discipled about politics from some other angle. Yeah. And if you want Rachel Maddow to disciple your people, then go right ahead. Or Sean Hannity, then go right ahead. But if you give them a biblical framework to think about politics and culture and society, they might actually listen to you as long as you do it like in sort of like a nonpartisan, bipartisan, yell at everybody, right? Tell them why they're wrong. And I think they'll be much more respectful of your position and opinion if you do it that way. Except all the boomers will walk out of your church and <sighs> stop giving you money. Yeah, well, yeah, that's the problem. The problem is the people that you want, the pastors always have to worry about the people that give the money, right? It's yeah. the 80-20 principle. 80% yeah. of your money comes from 20% of your people, and they tend to be the most rabid. You yeah. know, they tend to be the most, like, fringy on both sides, by the way. In mainline church, it's the other direction. It's the most liberal people that are keeping the mainline church afloat. It's the most conservative people keeping the evangelical church afloat. Same thing's happening in the primaries right now. Who are you trying to appeal to? The farthest right you can on the Republican side, and the farthest left you can on the mm-hmm. Democratic side. Mm-hmm. Do you, do you see any data that, that says a significant number of uh, Gen Z kids that are leaving evangelicalism show up in the mainstream church, or do they just leave Christianity? <laughs> They're gone. Entirely? They're just gone. I was writing a paper the other day about young mainline Protestants. Yeah. <laughs> the, the point of the paper was there are no young mainline Protestants in America. Like, in a sample of 2,000, okay, there were 30 mainline Protestants between the ages of 18 and 35. Like, there's almost no mainline Protestants yes. in America anymore. The average Episcopalian now is over 60 years old. I mean, it is it is, it is not good news for the mainline right now. That's not good. That's not good. And uh, what would make you think the future of the SBC or, you know, any other or non-denominational megachurches looks different? Well, I think the future of American evangelicalism is fewer churches but bigger churches, like oh, mergers and acquisitions is sort of oh, where we're headed right now. Lovely. I know. That's yeah, so no, but exciting. I think like like it's like the Goldilocks problem. Like, the, like the, the worst size your church can be from like a financial perspective is like 150 to 250. Yeah. Because you, you have enough people that you probably need a full-time pastor, but you probably don't have enough money to, to pay mm-hmm. a full-time pastor. So therefore, you're going to either hire someone and pay them peanuts or hire someone bivocational yeah. that really can't do the job. Like, it, when you've you got 75 people or less, you know you're going to get someone 10 hours a week, 15 hours a week, and that's fine because that's all you really need. These big churches can have staffs of 15, 20, 25 people, right? So yeah. it's just economies of scale at, the, at that level. And so if you look at the data, like the biggest shift in American Protestant Christianity is the decline of Southern Baptists and the rise of non-denominationals inside evangelicalism. Like the future of evangelicalism is non-denominational now. And all denominate not all, there's a couple of notable exceptions. The Assemblies of God still growing, but slowly. Mm-hmm. The PCA is growing, but they're really small. Like there's little, little examples— but generally speaking, these denominations are not growing. Uh, okay. They're declining, and non-denoms are just taking over. Okay, so then, okay, because we got to wrap up. How do we help Gen Z? What are they looking for that they're not finding? Yeah, I think an intelligent uh, presentation of what Christianity believes, not just the evangelical flavor of Christianity, but like mm-hmm. what Christians believe about stuff. like big, how Big picture. Big picture stuff. Like, why do we care about people? Why do we care about forgiveness and reconciliation? Why do we care about all these issues that I think people are struggling with? Like, I think young people really need, they've never been given a coherent framework to think about life. And I think Christianity can offer that for some of them. But I think the thing is they have to learn, the thing I preach to my to my college students, just in a very nonpartisan, non-religious way, is stop being so cynical about everything. 
Cynicism is an awful way to go through life. When you're always looking for what, why is that person running for office? Because they're trying, trying to get rich. Or why they raise the price on this? Because they're trying to take more money from me. Maybe it's actually more complicated than that, right? Cynicism is the default position. And it's the laziest position you can be in. Start thinking critically about things and not cynically about things. Institutions are what built this country. They built us from nothing to where we are today. And now all of a sudden we say all, all institutions are bad. No, 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 no. They are not bad. They can be bad because they're run by people who tend to be bad. But institutions at their best are salvific, hmm. right? They save us from poverty. They save us from death. They save us from eternal damnation if you're an evangelical. We have to believe in institutions again because they will bring us into the rest of the 21st century. Like, that's the only way forward we have. Whoa. So we have to get Gen Z kids excited about institutions again. Yeah. Does that mean we need to make new institutions? Or can we redeem existing institutions? Or is that really hard? I think it's really hard. But I think yeah. for some of them, it's impossible to reboot them. You know, you can't reboot the federal government or yeah. Congress. Yeah, right? they, they tried on January 6th. It didn't yeah, go, didn't didn't go, go so great. Very well, yeah, we got some but, good mug shots out of it, though, didn't we? They look, don't they look like they were AI? I felt like they were like <laughs> algorithm generated at one point, you know? Oh, uh, yeah, I'm not going to go there. I'm A sure there fake. were, I'm sure there were some that were, were floating around. Okay, so the kids, are the kids all right? Ryan Burge's answer, let me see if I can summarize. Uh, the kids have lost trust in institutions. They're, they are, you think there's a fear in believing in something, in believing in an institution, in believing in, in any kind of, you know, formal structure that was put together by your ancestors. Yeah, I think that's it. It's a, but the thing I push back and say, why are you so different than your parents or grandparents? You know what uh -huh, I mean? Like, what, right. you think like they needed religion to get through life. They needed institutions to help them get through their day. And you're like, nah, we don't yeah, need any no, of that. We'll be I fine. Just, I just need a, a good uh, bourbon, you know, in a cool club and a vacation every now and then to, to someplace Instagrammable. <laughs> and that's why mental health is in, in the tank right now. <laughs> oh, no. You know what I mean? Like, that's You're why right. we're struggling. Yeah. Like, we, yeah. we, have this, we have this major problem of discontent right now. Yeah. There's a solution to this problem, and we know what it is. It's like just no one wants to recognize it. Ooh, summarize that solution one more time. Solution is institutions. We need to believe in each other, and we need to believe in the structures that made America great. Because they'll make America great again. I mean, okay. we went from being a third-rate power to the superpower of the world because of our institutions. Okay, so uh, Ryan P. Burge is a pro-institutionalist, I think I we am. can uh, officially say. Even the institutions that brought us uh, the Jim Crow and some listen, uh, listen. not so good things. We're, 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 fo we're focusing on a more perfect union here, Phil. Yeah. Okay. All right, we have to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. It's a process. Okay. Okay, if you could st if you could start any new institution right now, what institution would you start that you think could make a difference? Oh, Mon man. Money's no object, and you don't actually have to do the work. Okay, so it'd just be a meeting place in every town, city, in in, in, in hamlet across America, uh -huh. where there'd be there'd be several weekly events like potluck suppers once or twice a week. Uh, you know, like a movie showing on Friday night, a get together on Saturday. You can just hang out, uh -huh. air conditioned, nice facilities. You can rent it out for birthday parties, graduations, Chris. You know, like whatever you okay. want to do. Just a gathering place for people uh -huh. to come would be the most amazing thing we could do for American society. I think. All right, folks, you heard it. The future of America is the rebirth of the mall. <laughs> we need more journeys. That's what we need. <laughs> Thank and Spencer's you. gifts. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, you can follow Ryan P. Burge. Where can we follow you, Ryan? Uh, at Ryan Burge on Twitter. Uh, my Substack is called graphsaboutreligion.com. You can look at graphs about religion there. Go check that out. Um, we need to figure out how to uh, redeem institutions, including the church and um, engage the next generation in them. Okay, thanks, Ryan. It's really helpful. This episode is sponsored by 10 by 10. 
More than one million young people in the U.S. are walking away from the church every year, but it doesn't have to be this way. 10 by 10 is a diverse group of Christ followers from different cultures, ethnicities, and traditions. 100 organizations working together to address this concerning trend. 10 by 10 has four priorities. To make youth discipleship a top focus for U.S. ministry leaders. To elevate leaders of color and their organizations and networks to reflect the diversity of the body of Christ in the world today to curate, create, and share resources and training to equip local leaders to reach the next generation and to connect and mobilize partner organizations to collectively impact 100,000 diverse faith communities nationwide. Learn more about 10 by 10 by going to the website 10by10.org. That's T-E-N-X-1-0.org. TENX10.org to empower you to help faith matter more to the next generation. And thanks to 10 by 10 for sponsoring this episode. Okay, I'm here with Sky Jitani and Kara Powell. Kara, you everyone knows Kara, right? Do we need to introduce Kara Sky? She's been on the show so many times, and she's a Holy Post pundit with the Tumblr to prove it. Although it's in the dishwasher, yeah, it's so in the dishwasher. This is Plan B for my Tumblr. Yeah, I hope it's that, not that a, a competing it, podcast Tumblr. No, it's something free I got from somewhere. So, Sky, I think I've been mispronouncing your last name this entire time because uh, Phil just said Jatani. And I've been mm-hmm. saying Jathani. Yeah, it goes both ways. Okay. It's normally a hard thing. But here's the thing. I am ultimately moving toward the place of just being known as Scott. Scott. Like like Cher yeah. or Bono. Prince. So, yeah, there's, right, there's no exactly. ego there at all. No problem. None. No, no, no. <laughs> well, just so I know, all... how do you prefer that people pronounce your last name? Uh, Jatani. Jatani, but okay. It's, yeah, but again, I've actually heard it within my own family pronounced both okay. ways. So it really? doesn't really matter. That's weird. Yeah. Okay, uh, people, mm-hmm. can we get to the topic at hand? Sorry. Yes. Yes. For the love. No, Sorry, Dad. No wonder, no wonder Gen Z is losing interest in us. <laughs> we can't stay on topic. Um, y'all listen to my conversation with Ryan Burge, Reverend Dr. Ryan P. Burge. Ryan P. Burge, S- yes. Yeah, and I was right. I thought I was guessing and making up a middle initial for him, and I was actually right. Hey, every now and then I'm right. What do you know about that? Um, what stuck out to you? Kara, do you want to go first? Like, what, what did you hear that uh, you went, oh, wow, I didn't realize that? Well, I love all the data. Um, I, I have not yet finished his new book, The Great Dechurching. I highly recommend it based on what I've read already. Um, but I, and I just love the data. I mean, I could swim in that all day. And I thought some of the points he made about institutional trust or lack thereof were really pretty important for us to pay attention to. That young people mm-hmm. just in general are distrusting institutions. And my understanding from other research is like the church and politicians were kind of neck and neck toward the bottom of young people's trust. And so Mm. no wonder they're not connecting with us if they don't trust us. So for me, the question, how do we regain or just gain that trust is a really important one. Yeah, I, that stood out to me too. And from my own experience, I'm, I I think there are very few people who are like, yeah, I will give my loyalty and trust to a nameless or an anonymous institution Mm -hmm. that is some bureaucracy. It's Mm -hmm. like we we feel loyal to an institution when we have actual relationships with the representatives of that institution. And I do wonder, as churches have gotten incredibly large, especially in the, the Protestant evangelical world, and fewer people actually know the leaders in a interpersonal way. They know them as a person on a stage or a screen, but they don't know them. It's easier to lose trust in an institution mm-hmm. when you don't have that relationship. Um, so I think that's a case where maybe the mega movement hasn't served us well. Um, even when I was a pastor, I knew people who left my church who I didn't know well at all, and it was easier for them to walk away. But the people who knew me or other leaders in the church well, 
may have had struggles, but they would have come talk to us and we would have relationally dealt with it before them just walking out the door. Yeah. So I think that gets a lot easier when you're just an anonymous institution yeah. rather than actual people. Yeah. You know, I we've studied, we at the Philly Youth Institute have studied trust some because it came up a lot in a, a new project we're doing called Faith Beyond Youth Group. And one of the themes in some of the research that I struggle with implementing, I'll confess, when it comes to trust is this, that trust is extended before it is earned. In other words, if we want young people to trust us, then we first need to trust them. Um, and I actually struggle with it less with young people than in other contexts. But I think, you know, building on what you're saying, Sky Jatani, about you know, relationality, how can we have the kind of relationships with young people that I think, like Ryan said, offer you know, what do you say, an intelligent presentation of the gospel and are, are, are intimate enough relationally that we are trusting young people. We are handing them the keys, literally or metaphorically, uh, for our church and its future. We are listening to their innovative ideas and willing to take some risks in implementing them. And maybe, just maybe, it's as we it's as if we trust young people that they might in turn trust us a little bit more. Yeah. What do you think about, uh, Kara, you specifically, what do you think about the gender flip <laughs> and the data he's getting yeah. that more Gen Z women are leaving the church than Gen Z men? That, yeah. That kind of stunned me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, that was surprising to me, too. I thought his explanation that it's largely connected with, with kind of the political climate that the church has stepped into or helped create is probably mm -hmm. a large, a large reason for that. I, I think I was equally intrigued, correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't he say educated women were more likely to be connected to faith community, yes. which th yes. that, that's an intriguing twist for me. So I actually, I'm, I'm even more perplexed. I can fathom why women these days are reacting more negatively toward the church after the last five, 10 years. Um, but the educated women are are reacting less negatively as non-educated women. That's intriguing to me. Anybody got any ideas about I, why? I, I I think I've read other pieces that in general, more educated Americans are more mm -hmm. likely to be right. involved in a church. Yeah. So th there's always the assumption that well, religion is for uneducated, yeah. you know, unintellectual people, yeah. and that's actually just the but opposite. You also, so, you also have the, the marriage data, you know, that says more educated people are more likely to be married, less educated right. people less likely to be married. I, I wonder if there's a yeah. family component to sure. that. If you are actually going ahead and starting a family, you're, you know, you want to pass something onto your kids and you look for that community or at least someone else to teach your kids something on Sunday morning you know, so where you can sneak out and get coffee or something. Yeah. So maybe there is, you know, the, the general uh, discarding of, of marriage as an institution, along with religion as an institution uh, yeah. that's happening more with the working class than with the upper class. I, I think the other point he made about the gender gap was interesting, not just the politics of it all, but the, and Phil, you and I have talked about this quite a bit on our show over the years, like the last 20 years, we have seen this hyper-masculinization mm -hmm. of, of especially evangelicalism. Mm -hmm. Kristen Kobes Dumaine, her book, Jesus and John mm -hmm. Wayne, documents this quite a bit. But there's so much militaristic rhetoric about what it means to be a Christian and the culture warring and the, the, the masculinity movement. All that stuff has just gotten ramped up so much in recent years in an effort to reach men, especially young men, I wonder if it's also been very off-putting yeah. to more women who want to actually follow Jesus in the church. Yeah, yeah, that may be. Uh, you know, I, I'm going to switch topics a little bit, if that's okay, off-gender. I, I thought what Ryan said, that it's the drift from the church is more about a slow slide than kind of a radical mm -hmm. rejection. Uh, uh, that really resonated with me. And it reminded me, Ryan didn't mention this, and I've only seen this written once or twice, so I don't know that it's really, it's not in the research ecosystem yet. But, you know, there are the nuns who, as Ryan said, are atheist as agnostic or nothing in particular. Another category would be the UMS, U-M-M-S, that, you know, are you involved in a faith community? Are you involved in a church? Um, 
Not right now at the moment. <laughs> and I actually yeah. think that's really descriptive, especially for post 18 year olds, especially after the pandemic. They have some kind of faith background, but they're just not prioritizing it. Faith in church was maybe important in the past, but um, not really. Or, you know, I try to go every once in a while, that kind of answer. So, so this ums category, I think, is pretty dominant uh, in young people. Hmm. I do wonder, there's a, there's a bit of a conflict. Um, people, the number one reason people have left religion is they moved. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. I moved, and I just never got around to finding. But it's the kids growing up who go to college that are more educated, that are moving more and more likely to move. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's working, working class kids that are less likely to move, but yeah. those are the ones that are leaving church more. So there's a little weirdness that I don't, you know, and maybe, maybe all the numbers are relatively close together, so it's just not that easy to explain. Yeah, I wonder if part of it is whether you're 18 or a young adult getting married and moving to a new city for a job, or even someone our age is who's who may relocate. There's a sense of well, when I, my when my life situation changes, there's no longer a sense that putting church or or congregational life back into the mix yeah. is an essential part yeah. of what I have to do. Yeah. There's a, I I wonder if the church has just failed to really grasp its essential role in people's lives. There's, it, it, for mm-hmm. some of us, it's just, well, it's what I grew up doing, or mm-hmm. yeah, it was fine, but I didn't need it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The way some people might move, and the first thing they're doing is getting a gym membership, or whatever it is that they're you know prioritizing. It's just not a priority, which means people don't see church as an indispensable part yeah. of either their life or their faith anymore. And that raises all kinds of questions. Yeah. Uh, Tim Clydesdale is a sociologist who, gosh, probably 15 years ago, talked about how young people put their faith in an identity lockbox, especially about when they go to college, graduate from high school, military workforce. And, you know, what you put in a lockbox is important to you. So on the one hand, it's important to you, but it's not a priority. It's not a central organizing principle in your life. It's valuable, but it's not part of your day to day. Um, and I, I think that relates to the slow so- slide and uh, the I moved as the reason to drift. Hmm. What do you think about his statement that, uh, that a lot of young people have never heard Christianity described in an intelligent, meaningful way, or I've never heard someone explain Christian doctrine in a way you know, that helps them look at the world and look at politics? Um, you know, avoiding politics or running, when we do run into politics, we tend to run in a very partisan way. But, you know, I'm thinking about Christopher Watkins' book, um, uh, Critical Biblical Theory, Hmm. and how he goes about going through the story of Scripture, but then bringing out the big principles that create a meaningful lens to look at the whole world. And if, I'm just wondering if there was more, if that's what, you know, kids are hungry for is, yeah. does this actually help me see the world or is it just another affinity group that I can be a part of, you know, that I don't find meaning in, you know, yeah. when we're like, I grew up having brunch every Sunday <laughs> and I stopped and realized it just isn't, I don't miss it that much. Yeah. Yeah. You know, as you were talking, Phil, I was thinking about a church we studied during some of our research where... Uh, before the last presidential election, so 2020, this church boldly and bravely had a Zoom, because it was during the pandemic, webinar discussion open to the whole church, where one of the elders, deacons in the church shared why he was voting uh, for President Biden, or for, excuse me, for President Trump, and the other explained why he, it was two males, was voting for Biden. Um, and when we went and visited the church, like a year later, what was fascinating is the young people, the teenagers were so proud of their church for being able to have that mm-hmm. discussion. So, you know, when we asked them, what do you love about your church? That was one of the top things that we can talk about mm-hmm. anything that we can have hard conversations. Now they paired that really quickly with the relationships that were in their church. So I fully agree with everything mm-hmm. that Ryan said about what we need a a more coherent, cohesive, reasoned explanation of faith. And I would say 
young people need to see that embodied in real life peers and real life adults in the way that those adults are living out Jesus every day. So to me, it's, it's both, both. Yes, it's the intellectual mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we can have these kind of hard conversations and, you know, I know Juanita or I know Carolyn and they're investing yeah. in me. That's what we hear from young people. Yeah, I, one, one of the most common feedbacks we get from our Holy Post audience is, why aren't we having these kinds of conversations in the church? Mm, yeah. Like they like the topics we're talking about or some of the guests we have on. And they're like, why can't we do this in the church? Yeah. And your example is a church that is having those conversations. And Ryan made the point that if church leaders are not willing to broach these topics and give their members and young people a biblical framework for thinking about this stuff, you mentioned the Imago Dei, then you're abdicating that responsibility to cable news or the algorithm in their yeah. in their social media feed, yeah. and then you wonder why people drift away. Yeah. Um, so this is really, it's a discipleship mandate yeah. that we, we have to, in our congregations, help people apply the gospel to the reality of being an American in the 21st century yeah. or a young American in the 21st century. And it doesn't mean being partisan. That example you gave, Kara, is a great one of, let's, let's have mature, godly people in the church with whom you hopefully have a relationship explain their different points of view, yeah. all honoring Christ. What a great model. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Last thoughts as we wrap this up. Um, Kara, what's the thing you took from this that you think is the most helpful or that, that we need to think hard about going forward? Uh, whew, there's five come to mind, but I think I'll share the one that came to mind first. And that was, um, just young people's distrust of institutions and how through small acts, through extending trust to young people, we have some hope of regaining that. Okay. Okay. Sky, what about you? Uh, that's a big one. I, this is more uh, nuts and bolts, but I thought his given the mobility of our culture and the fact that people leave the church most often just because they relocate, um, in a way, COVID was a massive relocation for the entire society, yeah. and it broke the momentum of going to church. Just the simple importance of church leaders, pastors, you know, youth pastors, whoever they might be, just taking the first step and reaching out to people yeah. rather than thinking that people are going to take the first step and reach out to them, mm -hmm. I think would make a huge difference. I do think, I just had this thought, um, the moving thing, you know, I stopped going to church because I moved. Also, the trend towards non-denominational evangelicalism. Mm -hmm. You know, when my grandparents moved, every town they moved to, they'd open the phone book and see if there was a Christian and Missionary <laughs> Alliance church. Mm -hmm. You know, or you see, what's the local SBC church? What's yeah. the local Lutheran church? With the death of denominations, yeah. there just is, what do you look for when you go yeah. to a new city? Yeah. You know, you, yeah. have to, right. you have to ask friends, hey, what's the best church? Yeah. And you don't know what you're asking for. So I wonder right. if that's a part of it. The death of, the, of denominational loyalty also means a difficulty to relocate and feel like you know where to look. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. Oh, I just came up with something big. So we need to launch new denominations. That's what we're going to do. New institutions, Perfect. new denominations. I've solved the problem. Thank you very much. Kara, thanks for showing up. Uh, always glad to hear what you have to think. Sky, you had no choice. You had to show None. up. None. So, you know, yeah. whatever, Con whatever. Contractually obligated. Hope the conversation helped you. Uh, we'll keep having more conversations about the next generation, Gen Z. Uh, bring Kara in for all of her help because she's doing great work at the Fuller Youth Institute. And we will see you all next time. Bye, guys. Bye. The Holy Post Podcast is a production of Holy Post Media. Production assistance by Mike Stralo. Editing by Area Code Audio. Help us create more thoughtful Christian media by subscribing to Holy Post Plus at holypost.com slash plus. Also, be sure to leave a review on Apple Podcasts so more people can discover thoughtful Christian commentary plus ukulele and occasional butt news. Visit holypost.com for show notes, news stories, Holy Post merchandise, and much more. 